Good morning, everybody. This is Jonathan Sanders with the VA Healthcare Summit 2020. I'm the Deputy Divisional Director of the Institute for Defense and Government Advancement, and I'm very happy today to uh, share with you an opening introduction for our upcoming speaker, Dr. Frederick D. Seifer. He is the Chief Physician Executive for Innovation Transformation, and uh, very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Seifer uh, joining us to brief on his topic here, COPD and bronchiectasis. Comorbid disease that attract attention now, and with that, I, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Seifer. Dr. Seifer, are you over there, sir? I am. Thank you for that generous introduction. So I want to again welcome everyone to the VA Healthcare 2020 Summit presentation on COPD and bronchiectasis, comorbid diseases that demand attention now. I've had a special appreciation um, for quite some time for the VA health system and the patient population that it serves uh, for uh, a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, my father was a World War II veteran, a uh, Purple Heart recipient. He's presently interned at Arlington Cemetery in Washington. My daughter is actually in active service. Um, I'm very proud of her. She is an aircraft commander in the Coast Guard flying uh, their jet. That's pretty cool. And um, during my entire medical training, starting with medical school, uh, continuing with residency and my fellowship, uh, each one of those institutions, Northwestern in Chicago, the Heinz VA, University of Illinois, the Jesse Brown VA, and uh, Duke University, uh, the Durham VA, all, all of my medical education from beginning to end, I had significant rotations at the VA hospitals. So I do have a, a, a real understanding for the veteran population and the health system that um, we are going to be talking about today. Uh, my disclosures are that uh, this talk is sponsored by Respitec, a Phillips company, and I do serve as a consultant and member of a clinical advisory board for, for Respitec and Phillips. So is this. Um, uh, this is actually Sisyphus. And for those of you who are uh, up to speed with your Greek mythology, Sisyphus was a king of a city-state in mythological Greece. And he wasn't the nicest guy in the world. And he um, got on the wrong side of the gods, which was not a smart move. And uh, Zeus, the head uh, god, sent him to Hades and basically said, here's your task. Roll this giant rock up this hill, and if you can get it to the top, I will release you from bondage. However, Zeus, of course, he, 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 he uh, rigged the game and uh, made sure that every time that the stone got up to the top of the hill, it rolled back on Sisyphus. The, the reason why I'm sharing this graphic with you is that I've been practicing as a pulmonologist for over 30 years. And a good part of that, that time, I felt like Sisyphus with the patient population we're talking about today. These patients would get sick, and I would do what I had to do, and I'd get them better, but then they would come back 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. They'd keep coming back. I could not keep them healthy, and I started to feel like this was a Sisyphean task, an impossible task. But what has happened over the last 10, 15 years is we now have tools in our toolbox we didn't have back in the uh, late 80s when I finished my fellowship and in the 90s, and and now, I don't feel like Sisyphus anymore. I can identify these patients with COPD, with comorbid bronchiectasis, get them what they need, keep them healthy, and keep them out of the hospital. So what I hope to share with you in the next 20, 25 minutes is how I do that. How do we deal with this problem? Well, first and foremost, we need to recognize that this is a bit of a train wreck. Because if you look at the VA population, which is the data that's uh, shown here on this graphic, one-third of the veterans' population that is currently identified as COPD, in fact, does not have COPD. And about two-thirds of the patients, the veterans who actually have COPD, have yet to be identified. And this problem is mirrored in the general civilian population as well. So um, first and foremost, when dealing with this disease, you have to recognize that you need to accurately identify the patients. You have to accurately define the patient population or you're never, you're never going to um, get things going in the right direction. 
what this graphic uh, demonstrates is that, unfortunately, if you jump into any health system, veterans, general population, approximately 50% of providers still believe that they can diagnose COPD clinically. What does that mean? They can look at a patient, listen to them, take a history, do an examination, put their hands out, stretched out, and say, you have COPD. But the reality is, if you look at the graphic to the left, the accuracy of diagnosing COPD without spirometry, that is clinically, it's like flipping a coin. It's that, it's that um, inaccurate. And then the graphic to the right is actually from some data that I generated about 10 years ago, because what happens is I, when I present to providers, they go, okay, all right, yes, we're misdiagnosing some patients, we're missing some patients, but we're, if somebody has significant COPD, we'll be able to diagnose that. Uh, clinically? And the answer is no. Uh, if you look at that graphic to the right, um, what this demonstrated that in a busy uh, primary care practice in upstate in Upper East Tennessee, 75% of the patients that that provider was missing already had moderate to uh, very severe disease. COPD in uh, 2008 actually overtook stroke as the third leading cause of death in the United States. There is this misperception that this is a disease that primarily affects men aged 65 years of age and older. And the reality is, as of 2000, uh, the mortality in women has surpassed men and 70% of patients with COPD are actually younger than 65 years of age. And if you look specifically at the VA population, 63% um, were less than 40 years of age. So if you are a woman veteran less than 40 years of age and you have COPD, you are most likely not to be diagnosed with COPD, which is a real problem. Now, what is the number one cause of COPD? It's smoking. So let's look at the uh, prevalence of smoking among veterans. Well, back in 1995, it didn't look so good. 74% uh, prevalence of smoking among veterans, and among the general population, it was 48%. So um, there, the prevalence of smoking among the VA population back in 1995, it was one and a half times the general population. Let's now move forward to 2018, tremendous progress uh, made among the veteran population and the general population, down to 25% smoking prevalence among the veterans population and 15% among the civilian population. Interestingly, um, the gap between the veterans population and the general population increased uh, to 1.66 times as compared to 1.5 times in 1995. So if if the prevalence of smoking is higher among the VA population, you would expect the prevalence of COPD to be higher, and that is the case. This data was generated from 2002. Uh, prevalence of COPD among the veterans population, 13.4% compared to 7% among the general population, almost a two times prevalence uh, among VA population compared to the general population. Now, the VA operates one of the largest integrated healthcare systems in the United States, providing healthcare services to more than 3 million veterans. Uh, within this population, in the year 1999, there were 318,861 veterans diagnosed with COPD. You know, that's a kind of a, 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 a general number. <laughs> um, with the average yearly cost to treat one of these patients at $10,618, if you do the simple math, back in 99, the Veterans uh, Health System spent $3.38 billion managing this patient population. Let's zoom forward to four. That number went up to $5.5 billion, and I don't have uh, 2020 data, but I'm, can, I'm sure it's north of $6 billion in 2020, maybe north of $7 billion. How do you diagnose COPD? The gold standard is that you use something called spirometry. This is the gold standard. This is how you diagnose COPD. And this is what a handheld spirometer looks like. Now, can you diagnose 
hypertension, high blood pressure without a blood pressure cuff? No, it requires a specific piece of equipment. Can you diagnose diabetes without checking someone's blood sugar? No, you need to check their blood sugar. To diagnose COPD, you need a spirometer. Every PCP office in the United States should have a spirometer in the office. They all have blood pressure cuffs. They should have spirometers. Unfortunately, right now in the, in the, in the general population, about only half of PCPs have spirometers in their offices. Of those PCPs that have those spirometers, only about half of those providers are actually using the device. And of the ones who are actually using the device, best case scenario, only half of those providers actually know how to interpret the data correctly. So you can see this is a bit of a train wreck. And I do believe that this problem certainly uh, exists within the VA health system as well, based on the data that I shared with you previously. So um, even though spirometry is required by all guidelines to diagnose COPD, if you look at the American College of Physicians, their clinical guidelines from 2011, you look at the American Academy of Family Practice, basically they both state you need to do spirometry to diagnose this disease. You cannot diagnose the disease clinically. Again, less than percent of providers in the general population have, have these devices and use them routinely and know how to interpret the data correctly. So first came to upstate New York, or I like to say up, up, upstate New York. If I was any further upstate, I'd be in another country. Um, the first thing I did was I wanted to know the lay of the land. So working with the ACO, which was uh, really had our best data pool that I could actually mine with some accuracy. Um, they had, at that point in time, when I first landed here in 2014, I think it was, uh, about 1,500 patients that were identified within the ACO as, quote, having COPD. Well, I went through the, uh, the AMR, and only 13% of those patients actually had spirometry which meant that 87% of those patients were diagnosed clinically, which means that half of those patients, half of that 87% we know, did not have COPD. Um, so one of the first things I did when I got here was um, do a series of didactic sessions for all the PCPs in our health system. Then we purchased spirometers, embedded them in every PCP practice, then I overread all their spirometry for a year to make sure that they could interpret the data correctly. And over a period of two years, we were able to move needles substantially from 13% all the way up to 44%. And frankly, I need to slice the grapefruit again. I need to mine that data now in 2020 and see where we're at. I do believe that we, are, we probably now are somewhere uh, around 60 65% compliance. So the bottom line is, this is a problem that can be solved. This could be solved. If this could be solved in up, up, upstate New York, which is a, a very rural and challenged community, this certainly is a problem that can be solved within the VA health system. It just requires uh, commitment, dedication, and perseverance. So now you think it's safe to go outside. You know how to diagnose COPD. Well, there's another problem. I'm going to throw a wrench in the works here. There's another disease. It's called bronchiectasis. And for those of you who have heard of this disease, you've probably heard of it in the context of cystic fibrosis. But this is the, this is the non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis pop population. And um, when I first started in healthcare, if you had a board's question, how many people in the United States have non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, the correct answer would have been 100,000. Um, but I recognized um, right out of my pulmonary fellowship that this, the prevalence of this disease was much, much higher than anyone thought it was. And, and in actuality, um, the number now is around, considered to be around 4 million, and that actually comes from work uh, that I did with my colleagues uh, and was published, I think, in 2017 in the Chronic Respiratory Disease Journal, um, and the true number of patients in the United States with non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis is a, is a little north of 4 million. And from work that uh, other people have done in this space in the last few years, it does appear that conservatively 
over 50% of patients with moderate to very severe COPD have at least radiographic bronchiectasis. That if you do do the special test, the high resolution CT scan, you will find that you'll find that you'll find bronchiectasis in in north of 50% of those patients. Now that doesn't mean that that is clinically significant, but you'll find the radiographic bronchiectasis. Now, I, uh, this, is, this is actually uh, another publication uh, that came out in 2019 in the same journal, the Chronic Respiratory Disease Journal, and what this demonstrated was that these patients with COPD, with comorbid non cf bronchiectasis, these patients are two to three times as sick as the patient without comorbid bronchiectasis, and they consume two to three times uh, as much healthcare dollars. So that is, so you could say, all right, so what, who cares? Well, this is the so what, who cares? If you're a mission-driven person, these patients, they don't do well. Their quality of life is not good. And if you're margin-driven, um, this is gonna eat your health system alive if you don't get it under control. These patients present. They present with cough, sputum, hemoptysis, wheezing and dyspnea. Well, that sounds like a regular COPD patient, doesn't it? So the, what, how would you differentiate between a, a patient with just COPD alone and a patient with COPD and comorbid non-CF bronchiectasis? If you get a story, you have a COPD patient, who gives you a story of recurring lower respiratory tract infections characterized by cough productive of purulent sputum that requires antibiotics to control. And that happens multiple times at any given calendar year. That patient should be considered having comorbid non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis until proven otherwise. Now, how do you diagnose this disease? You need a high-resolution CT scan. You can have somebody with, as the, I actually practiced in, in Upper East Tennessee for about 20 years, so I picked up a few expressions. And one of the expressions was bad sick, and another one was eaten up with. So you can have a patient who, has, who is bad sick with comorbid non-CF bronchiectasis and, quote, eaten up with bronchiectasis on a high-res CT scan and their chest x-ray can be stone cold normal. So it's a real important point here that the CT, the, you need a high res CT scan. You cannot diagnose this, this comorbid problem with a regular chest x-ray. And this is what it looks like on a high res CT scan. Uh, you see that red arrow there. That is pointing to a bronchiectetic dilated airway. And that was uh, on cross section, and this is caught. This is another high res CT scan where you catch an airway that is cut longitudinally. These are dilated airways, and this is my favorite graphic because you know the, the expression of pictures worth a thousand words. Here it is. So if you look at the uh, the red arrow to the far right of the graphic, you see these. They look like deflated balloons, these dilated saccular airways. That is a classic bronchiectatic airway. And then you see the arrow in the middle, and that is a, an airway that's cut in cross-section, and that's a dilated saccular airway filled with um, pus. And then you go to the far uh, left, upper right, uh, upper left corner, and that again is an airway cut on the long section filled with blood. Now, patients with clinically relevant COPD with comorbid clinically relevant bronchiectasis, this is what you're going to see if you were to open up their chest and slice their lung like a grapefruit. This is what you're going to see. And as you can see from this, the, cl the reason why it's so important to identify this comorbidity is that if you don't, this patient will be labeled COPD with exacerbation or bronchitis with with exacerbation or chronic bronchitis with exacerbation or asthma with exacerbation. And they're going to be treated accordingly with bronchodilators, maybe steroids, and 
and antibiotics. Does, does that sound like something that's going to be effective in a patient with a, with a chest that looks like this? And the answer is no. To treat this disease, you need aggressive airway clearance. You need to get that pus and that blood out of those airways so that you can get these patients better. So this is what, this is what airway clearance looks like. These are high-frequency chest wall oscillators. There are multiple companies that make these devices. Um, interestingly, these devices didn't really exist until the early 90s. There was a pulmonologist who had a large cystic fibrosis patient population in, the, in Minnesota, and um, he actually invented the very first high-frequency chest wall oscillator. Up until that point in time, cystic fibrosis patients, their life expectancy was mid-teens. And now a, a lot of progress has been made in the, in the treatment management of cystic fibrosis over the years, but this certainly was a foundational treatment. And today, patients with cystic fibrosis, we don't know their life expectancy. I, I have a colleague who's in her 50s with cystic fibrosis, and I'm firmly I'm convinced that this was a foundation, foundational intervention high frequency chest wall oscillation. I was actually one of the very first pulmonologists in the United States to get my hands on, on a device, on a, on a prototype high frequency chest wall oscillator and use it on a patient with non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis back in the 90s. Now, yes, there is chest physiotherapy and that is the gold standard, hand percussion. That's been around forever and it is very effective but it requires special training and commitment. And the bottom line, it's a dying art. And in the hospital setting, respiratory therapists don't have the time to spend 20, 30 minutes in a patient room multiple times a day. They just don't have the time. And imagine trying to do this in a home setting. It's just not gonna happen. So the advent of high frequency chest wall oscillation is huge in the management of non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Now, this is a bit of a busy graphic. Um, I'll walk you through it. Uh, for those of you, you may not be aware that New York State Governor Cuomo um, got $8 billion, that's with a B, $8 billion from the federal government to come up with a better way to manage its Medicaid population. And this whole experiment for managing Medicaid in the state of New York was called DISRIP, the DISRIP program. And what they did was they divided the state geographically into 25 buckets, and then that $8 billion was sprinkled out among these buckets based on the, the population that that bucket served. The Adirondack Health Institute is the bucket that my health system, St. Lawrence Health System, was part of. And AHI received $187 million of that original $8 billion, of which I received a $750,000 grant to develop a soup to nuts A to Z grid to manage our COPD population. And I don't know if you can see this, if it's large enough on your screen, but it's basically four modules. And in, in a very quick flyover, this is what we did. Number one, accurately identify the patient population, which I shared with you earlier. Um, the spirometers were embedded in all the PCP offices. They got the appropriate education. So the first thing we did was clean up our patient population. We got rid of the patients that were diagnosed with COPD who did not, in fact, have COPD, and then figure out what they actually did have. And then we identified the patients with our, in our, within our population that had COPD that were being missed. So that was fundamental. Then the next intervention, the second module, was, okay, let's make sure that all these patients that now, in fact, have COPD are actually being managed appropriately per um, goal. So there are, there are national, international recommendations for the management of COPD, uh, and we made sure that we were gold compliant. Number three. Remember, half of these patients with moderate to very severe COPD also have comorbid bronchiectasis. So we started aggressively mining for those patients. And 
discovered that, sure, we did have a lot of patients with comorbid non-CF bronchiectasis. In fact, when I first landed here in upstate New York, there were zero patients identified with comorbid bronchiectasis. We now have over 200 patients identified with comorbid non-CF bronchiectasis who are, now being a treat, who are now being effectively treated for both their COPD and their bronchiectasis. And what did that translate into? It translated into a 30% reduction in hospitalization for this patient population. So, so what keeps you up at night? Uh, I have to be honest with you that managing COPD and with and without comorbid bronchiectasis used to keep me up at night, but it doesn't anymore because I've solved that Rubex cube. I know how to take care of these patients, and I'm taking good care of them, and I feel good about it, and I'm sleeping great at night. So the problem is clear. The VA health system has a problem managing COPD with and without comorbid bronchiectasis, as well as the general population. The solution is now at hand. I've shared the solution with you. You can turn this situation around, but it's going to take some heavy lifting. It's going to, re it's going to require a commitment and a focus and an action plan and really uncompromising uh, resolve. When I approach a, a problem like this, for success, I have to commit, I have to make a commitment that nothing short of success is an acceptable outcome. And with that kind of commitment, this is surmountable. This is a surmountable problem. And you, like Sisyphus, like me, we can get that stone up to the top of that mountain and we can keep it there. We can be liberated from bondage, um, but it is going to take that kind of commitment. Thank you. Any questions? Questions. Thank you.